Okay, everybody, welcome to today's webinar, AbilityNet webinar about building accessible apps. And in particular, we're going to be focusing on the Barclays mobile banking app and how they um, built the app with accessibility built in. And uh, it's the first app that we've accredited. And so we'll be talking about the testing process and some of the details about building an app that's accessible to the standard that, it, that this one is. The session will last about 45 minutes. We've got about 30 minutes worth of presentation time and plenty of time for questions as we go along, as well as at the end. So um, what we're going to be covering, uh, introducing the, um, the idea of working with accessibility in apps, so briefly explaining what accessibility and means in, in, in the mobile space. Barclays will be talking about the business case for accessibility, why they take on this sort of uh, undertaking. Then we'll be looking at the mobile banking app in detail, um, what the project was, uh, and um, looking then at the testing of the, of the app and where that was done within the process. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the issues that we encountered and how we dealt with them, and then finally ending up with some lessons learned for all those involved. We have um, four guests today. Um, I'm going to get them to introduce themselves in a minute. Uh, Robin, are you on online and active? Are you there? Could you say who you are and, and what your role is? I am indeed. Thanks, Mark. So yes, Robin Christofferson. I'm head of digital inclusion at AbilityNet, and uh, yeah, just um, general overseer of the technology uh, advocacy part that AbilityNet plays in helping make sure that everyone's aware of how important technology is, and particularly digital inclusion. Great, thank you. And Clara, hello, Clara. Are you? Is it all working at your end? Hi, Mark. Yes. Uh, so my name is Clara Wilhelm. I am part of the uh, mobile digital team at Barclays. So our team looks at the mobile banking app, at Pingit, and other new banking mobile offerings. Great, thank you. And, and hi, Paul. And I think you're in the same room as Clara, aren't you? Sure. Hi, Mark. Hi, everyone. So I'm Paul Smythe. I head up IT accessibility for Barclays. That's around free broad things, around uh, awareness and education, around setting and promoting standards and governance, um, and around innovation and improvements for about what more we can do to better meet the needs of say, our older customers and uh, attract and support a diverse workforce. Great, thank you. And hi, Joe. Um, Joe Chidzik here from AbilityNet as well. Joe, could you say a little bit about your role in AbilityNet? Sure. Hi, Mark. So, yeah, I'm Joe Chizik, Senior Accessibility and Usability Consultant at AbilityNet, and my day-to-day -day job is going on site, meeting clients, and reviewing applications and websites firsthand for accessibility and making recommendations. Great. Thank you. Um, so, when I'm Mark Walker, I'm the Marketing Manager for AbilityNet. I'm hosting. Uh, I host the webinars generally, and I'll be sort of running through and, and hosting this session. But a little bit of housekeeping. If you do want to ask any questions as you go through, um, please do let me know. Use the questions box. Where I can, I'll bring the question in as, as appropriate, but we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions as well. Um, I've also got a couple of polls, and I'm going to run one now just to make sure that this software is actually working in this. So I'm going to ask you what your interest is in the poll, in the event. Um, are you a web developer, an accessibility expert, a UX designer? Um, there's an other box there. If you use the questions to tell me something that's not listed, if you think it's useful, obviously what this is going to help us do is just guide the type of discussion that we have in general. So if there's something in particular that you're interested in that relates to your role, please use the question box to tell us who you've got. So at the moment we've got, uh, you can tick more than one on this one, I think. Uh, you could have, be an accessibility expert and a UX designer. Um, the majority at the moment saying they're accessibility experts. Um, which is obviously going to put us all on the spot. And uh, some people from marketing and business development, uh, web developers, and some UX people. So most people have voted now. I'll just close the poll and show you uh, what the results have said. So 28% web developer, 40% accessibility expert, 28% UX designer, 12% marketing and business, and other. Um, I've got a business analyst. I've got somebody mentioning here. So just gives you a sense of the, of the, of the scope of uh, people who are here. I'm just going to um, hide that and then do another one. Um, this one's more about which of the following are of interest to you. And again, this is just to give us a chance to focus on the right areas that will be relevant. Are you interested in top tips about accessible design? Is the testing something that you're particularly interested in? Um, the commercial 
uh, angle and um, Barclays take on the business case for accessibility and um, some of the project management issues uh, could be interesting to you. And then again, there is an other box. So if there is in particular something, um, then we'll, uh, something will be booked up there. Just to clarify, if um, uh, there won't, I will be the only people speaking on this. So you're all, all automatically muted by the system. So the fact that you can't speak is so that we don't end up with everyone trying to talk at the same time. Um, if, you, if, you, if you are struggling to use the, um, the questions box, then there is a chat box as well. And you can tell me that there's something there that you're struggling with or use email. Thank you. So we've got a content manager in there as well. I'm going to close the poll. I've got to um, share the results with you. Uh, mostly you're interested in top tips about accessible design, which covers a multitude of things, I'm sure. Um, some interested in the testing um, and some interest in the commercial value with accessibility. OK, cool. So um, let's get started. I'll just hide the results of that. Let's get started and back onto the slides. Uh, Brief introduction to AbilityNet. You may know that we're a UK-based charity that delivers all uh, services to a range of different um, business and charitable and uh, disabled people uh, across the UK and elsewhere. Uh, we have workplace services to help disabled people in work. We help disabled students. We also um, build and uh, help people build and test um, accessible websites and apps and other digital content. Um, we provide free IT support to disabled people in their home. And we have a couple of other um, projects, My Computer, My Way, which is a guide to all the accessibility features in all platforms, uh, mobile and desktop platforms. And we've also just launched the fifth Tech for Good Awards, which celebrate people who use technology to do good. So a, a broad spectrum, and in particular, the accessibility services that we do, we have a, a team of people based in Warwick and London that deliver services to a range of customers, including Barclays um, and others. So um, the fact that this is an app, um, I think the broader context for this is about the changes from our side in seeing accessibility and, and mobile. Robin, could you just briefly give us an overview of where accessibility is changing in terms of going mobile and how that changes our work and the work of people who are trying to build accessible um, digital tools? Absolutely. Well. <coughs> Obviously, the landscape has, has changed a lot over the last few years. Mobile, you know, which might have had a question mark over it two or three years ago, now is very much at the centre of people's online strategy. On a daily basis, the average traffic that goes to a typical website is over half from mobile devices. So mobile is very much at the you know, forefront of, of people's minds when it comes to digital. Um, for us at AbilityNet, we've seen an increasing number of clients wanting us to test their websites and apps on mobile. Um, it used to be that websites perhaps would have an alternative version for mobile, but now obviously it's all about responsive design. So as well as asking us to test a website on desktop browsers with desktop assistive technologies, they also want us to test how it appears <coughs> when it's responsively um, reshaped itself for the smaller screen, and we would be testing those on a range of different tablets and phones and we also do dedicated native apps that have been created uh, and downloaded onto mobile as well and there are some very typical very constant accessibility uh, requirements you know good color contrast a decent default font size and, and a sensible choice of font um, not having clickable or tappable areas that are t too small or too close together that are typical across desktop and mobile and whether it's a, a mobile web app or a, a mobile app itself. Um, but then there are some very specific requirements that are different to each platform. So iOS running VoiceOver, which is the screen reading software that I use, um, will have some different specific considerations compared to TalkBack on Android, for example. And there are a range of other platforms. Windows Phone finally has now got some screen reading capability as well as magnification too. So um, it's an increasing part of our uh, testing regime and a very, very important aspect. Accessibility is as important on mobile, probably more so because disabled people are tending to go there first. It's their first port of call. Mobile apps and web versions of, uh, mobile versions of the website are very much simpler. They're kind of very cut down, very clean experiences compared to desktop. So they're very much favored by people with a range of different disabilities. And it's really important to consider 
accessibility and you know inclusive best practice right from the very start of any project, uh, especially when mobile is going to be one of the destinations of that project. Great, thank you. And um, Paul, um, we're going to talk about Barclays, uh, you know, in terms of the work that you're doing specifically on the app, but. Um, we have a we have worked on a, a presentation we did in uh, back in October I think about the business case for accessibility in Barclays. Could you briefly tell us what that is? Um, that just I mean the webinar is available for people to view, but you know the, the sort of headline for why Barclays is putting this sort of time and effort into accessibility. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, I guess as as we see it, it, it is very much a, a commercial carrot as opposed to a legal stick in terms of why bother uh, doing accessibility. We think about an aging demographic. Um, aging disability highly correlated and this growing minority of our customer base but isn't getting great service and how we can act as a differentiator in terms of our bank to better meet their needs. Um, wh when I sort of think back about the history we focused on disability agenda in terms of our, our staff um, and workforce. I think three years back we were f the first bank to launch talking cash machines and really the positive sort of PR, that I think that really woke up our um, senior executive team into what more we can do in this space. So a couple of years back, you know, making a public statement, our ambition to become the most accessible bank, I mean, it's just very much snowballed from there. So, you know, we're very much serious and committed and have a, a broad range of programs of what we're doing. I, I guess when I think about the banking landscape, I think Robin's given a good intro into mobile and on the tech side how it's changing. When we think about banking more broadly, that's changed too, right? You know, in the past it was very much around our branch network on the high street and or maybe telephone based. And, you know, people now want to do their banking, you know, where they want, how they want, um, when, when they want. So really this uh, focus on digitization has become far more important. Clearly there's, there's things we're doing to make sure that for disabled older customers in particular, our branch network and telephony um, are still easier to use, um, such as use of beacons in branch or um, voice biometrics using your voice prints as a security um, step within telephone banking. Um, but it is very much a focus on digitization. Um, I think when I think about the um, you know Bill Gates quote about banking, uh, banking is essential, but banks are not. Um, you, you've probably seen it in the press and media over the last year. We'll focus on things like our digital eagles. Um, basic IT skills training uh, around code playgrounds, uh, coding in kids, and life skills, giving advice and support for uh, uh, teenagers switching from a school place to the workplace, um, right across to payments and contactless wearables and, and pay bans. So the, the concept of what a traditional bank does has changed, as well as channels and more focus on our online and mobile banking presence. And I guess final sort of for, from the accessibility angle before I hand over to is when we look at the, the customer surveys and when we target our disabled and older bank customers, we find that proportionally their usage of online and mobile banking is lower than Joe Public. But for those who do use it, their customer satisfaction scores are through the roof. So there's a real opportunity uh, to really home in and make sure that our online and our mobile apps are as easy to use for everyone. Brilliant, thank you. And, and um, I read a, a, a stat today that said 27% of young people have never been in a branch of a bank. Um, and obviously that's <laughs> all about millennials and that's a big change, you know, from uh, probably 20, 15, 20 years ago. And then I, I guess in terms of looking at what Clara, what you're looking at is specifically delivering mobile services. Um, can you tell us a bit about, you know, where that fits into the work that you're doing now, the sorts of things that you're working on? Absolutely. Actually, less than uh, three years ago, we didn't even have a mobile banking app. So big change to the bank. We were absolutely late to the market, um, and we looked at all our competitors who already had apps out there. We looked at their reviews, and I think one key element that we took out of it is that you know we need, if we want to be better than anyone else, we really need to focus on usability and really good customer experience. Because I think that that's where the uh, competitors tend to have negative comments. So, um, so when we came up with our app, um, you know, that as the focus was all around being native, being easy to engage with. Uh, from the start, we actually built a relationship with AbilityNet to make sure we also look at the accessibility angle of um, of our app. And if you look at it now, three years later, we've got four million active customers. 
Uh, we've launched the app on four platforms, so we are on iOS, Android, Windows, and BlackBerry. Uh, we get 1.5 million unique logins a day, and the channel, the mobile channel, has become increasingly important. As Robin mentioned earlier, mobile really has taken the lead from online. So nearly half of all our mobile customers have never used online before. So that is a big, uh, you know, that's a big sign for us how, that how important the mobile channel has become. Yeah. And if you then look at, um, you know, achieving accreditation, um, that was, you know, not something that we decided to do last year as a project. It was something that we really thought about again from the start. It was very important to us that the app was uh, usable, accessible for for all our customers. Um, so. Uh, probably about mid last year, the um, the team that was kind of looking at accessibility um, from the mobile development side uh, came to me and they said, you know, Clara, it would be really good if you can give us some business support, some sponsorship, maybe some funding, because we've done some really good work with AbilityNet and with our own mo mobile accessibility consultant. However, what's missing is just that those last few bits and we could get accredited. And um, when I then kind of spent a bit of time around accessibility, it really quickly became clear that, you know, accessibility is not something that is for a small group of people. You know, if you look at inclusive design, you can, you can really um, make, you know, give benefits to all our customers. So for me, it was a very quick sale. So I'm like, yes, absolutely. But what do we need to do to make this happen? And you know, as much as everyone in, you know, likes accessibility, wants to support it, when it competes with a lot of other projects, you know, can be very, very difficult at times. So um, I think it probably was quite good timing uh, when I was approached because I was also engaged with a redesign project, so the Barclays Mobile Banking app, uh, where we looked at how to best structure our um, home screen, how to make it more discoverable, um, you know, for, for our customers. And um, it kind of, you know, it, it just seemed to be a great idea at that time to just bring those two things together and say, hey, you know, a redesign project, I think we want to make this an absolutely amazing experience for all of our customers. Let's make sure accessibility is part of, part of its core. Um, because again, you know, inclusive design will work for everyone. So, um, you know, no one can argue with that and it makes absolute sense. And um, we actually then decided to um, pull accessibility forward. Um, and when we had our um, uh, even early concept reviews and you know weekly design reviews, we would have a net present. We would have a mobile accessibility consultant from our side present, and we'll give feedback, constant feedback. So it felt like we were all shaping the redesign together. You know, so it was kind of a real big shift from how we'd done work before. Thank, uh, thanks, Clara. Can you just to clarify? Can you tell me a little bit about the teams that work with you? And because um, you're talking about accessibility cons and consultants within your team, I think you have mm. a list within your team as well. Can you give us a sense of how big the teams are and the numbers of people involved and so on? Well, to be fair, it is far clear. So our teams are huge. Uh, I wouldn't want to comment on, on all the teams, but to be fair, if you look at the redesign project alone, um, you know we probably would have about um, we probably had about four. Um, Two UX designers, two UI designers. Um, we'd have, uh, you know, a, 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 we would have a develop, um, a, I'm sorry, an Android developer on there, an iOS developer. They'd have their own little teams. Um, we'd have our on-site accessibility consultant, you know, which kind of gives our um, developers and also in this case the designers ongoing guidance and support, but then we'd also bring you in um, on a weekly basis because it was just so important to us to get to the next level, fully aware that you'd never accredited an app before and we wanted AbilityNet to be part of the journey as much as, you know, make sure we can get to the point of getting our app accredited. Okay, cool. And then in, in terms of the timeline, which I've pulled up now, the I mean, has that approach meant that this is a longer project than you'd otherwise have undertaken? Has the, has the accessibility caused that to be a bigger or, you know, is it 10% longer, 20% longer? Or is it just that you've, you've been sit, hit, sitting on the same sort of schedules that you would have done normally? No extension to um, uh, timelines, um, no additional costs. It was actually, you know, but because it, it happened so early on. So when you get to concept stage, you do actually do, um, you bring the right kind of um, 
input into the concept and also then in the early design, you just, because we shaped it together, it didn't actually add anything to the timelines and as I said, it didn't cost us any more. It actually probably saved us a lot of money because what would have usually happened is that we would have done a redesign, we get we get to the point where we sh uh, get to sh uh, deployment or shortly before the deployment, we do a review, then we'll find some issues and we'll decide to do um, fixes later on so that we prioritize. So some fixes mean they have to be done before we can go into deployment and some other fixes mean they will uh, you know, be put on a log and we'll fix them when we can. So you know, by doing it the other way around, we just made sure it was core to the whole journey. So there wasn't any big surprises at the end of it. Okay. Um, it only took us six months to be fair, which is very, very, um, which is quite fast. I mean, if you look at features for our mobile banking app, we actually can do those in three months. It's just because it was a redesign project and we had a lot of um, review sessions with any kind of customers. So it was our, um, so which means customers with impairments, but also just, um, as I said, any customer, just to make sure um, we were spot on with what we were producing. And just, and I just, uh, what we did differently, we didn't just to reiterate what I just said. Um, in the past, when we did accessibility reviews, they would come just at the end of the development stage. And the real big shift that we did, that it's really impacted how we work and it's made this big difference, is by involving accessibility and inclusive design at the start. And if you do that and you constantly check, you, sa you save yourself time later on and cost later on. So it absolutely did make sense to change it. At any kind of new bigger projects now, that's the, that's the approach that we're taking. And presumably the size of the team in this sense of, you know, you, you're obviously describing a, a large group there, that principle would still apply in terms of it's just bringing it further up the process within the design process. Did you have people within the design teams or the development teams with lots of experience or were they starting from scratch with their knowledge, you know, having not normally done that at that stage in the process? Um, so to be fair, we, we did have we did have a bit of a lesson learned uh, with all the designers, with the whole team, where we looked at all the um, I guess issues that we found previously in our app, and we kind of just made sure everyone is aware of what those issues potentially could be. I mean, we've always had guidelines around you know color contrast, sizing, etc. But another big thing that we did actually through the process was to update our um, UI guidelines, as an example here and make sure that um, throughout the guidance are certain accessibility hints. Because um, one thing which is kind of a lesson there which, which come later on as well is that um, we really have to make sure with accessibility it becomes part of day-to-day -day work so everyone is aware of it. So just having your um, a separate site, for example, for it, that's all good and great and all the information needs to be there. But how do you make sure, especially when you're a large company, but people change, people move on, that you know you always keep it in the forefront of their mind, and that's why bringing it into their tools, into their documents, etc. Whatever, uh, what anything that anyone ever looks at, should have that fed into it, um, as much as you know how to use our logo. It just needs to be part of your day-to-day -to -day tools, also from a design, from a development, from any perspective, really. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And um, so uh, clearly, in part of that process and <clears throat> that iterative process that you. Sort of said rather than leaving it all to the end that is the testing which is um sort of in addition isn't it that it, it, it's looking at what how it's working providing feedback and then iterating and moving forward so um joe you're uh, you've led the work really on the on the testing side from 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 ability nets point of view can you just tell us just briefly to introduce this what's different about testing apps what what is it particularly about doing apps that, that, that was a challenge from your side Sure. So, so when I'm testing a website, I've got various tools and I can interact and investigate the code and not only work out why a problem's occurring, but I can tell people how to fix it. When you're reviewing an application, you're, you're restricted in so much as it's more passive testing. All right, so the main method I use for testing is actually using the built-in voiceover screen reader that Robin mentioned earlier. And you use that just to go through the same process that a user would and see how the app responds, how it behaves when you're interacting with it. Are buttons announced as buttons? Are headings announced as headings? And so on. Now, being a sighted user, I can pinpoint where issues occur, and I can explain that to developers who then go away and fix them. So that's, so that's one method of testing the app. 
Um, on top of that, we carry out a standard visual check, and that's just looking at the layout, making sure icons are a decent size, there's good color contrast, the layout isn't too cluttered, and so on. And the third part, which we carried out a few times throughout the evolution of this app, is disabled user testing. And that's a really valuable component where we actually invite disabled users into our usability labs and get them to use the app under controlled conditions where we have a moderator who will ask them questions and watch them interact with the app and, and note down any feedback that they encounter. So that, that you know, complements the, uh, the more consultancy-led testing that I do very well. Right. And, and Clara, this, I mean, in terms of your, your involvement in the process, this was just a, a, I think it says here they did it three times, that was something you just scheduled and then built in and then the results came back into the team and, you know, that then led to the next stage of development. Is that is that right? Well, I would say in the case of um, our redesign project, it was very iterative. So, um, you know, we'll take feedback on port and straight straight embed that and then be the next version out there. So, um, so it, it, it was scheduled to some extent, but I guess we had a lot of uh, review time and, and when ability wasn't there, ability net wasn't there, obviously we had our own on-site um, accessibility consultant as well that was giving daily kind of feedback when needed. And, and in just as an overall picture, do you, to what extent do you think the accessibility uh, requirements or the review or the feedback actually shaped what you would otherwise have done? Would, did it have a dramatic effect or was it small and small changes? Are they subtle changes in some areas and less in other, in other areas? Just as you know, it's actually interesting because if you looked at previous reports that we had from AbilityNet when it was done at the end of a, um, you know, at the end of a project, you know, basically going a feature was going into our uh, into mobile banking. Um, you know, some of the um, changes we would have had to make would have been quite big and impactful and costly. But because it was so early on, to be fair, you know, because uh, from a concept stage, um, it we just it was just basically guided into the right direction. I wouldn't say that anything was, um, you know, really wrong or, or um, a big hot issue. It was just because the feedback came so early, it didn't cause a problem at all. It just, as I said, shaped the design into the right direction. Great, thank you. And Joe, um, we've picked out three issues which you raised. Um, can you briefly just give us an overview of this? And obviously there's probably quite a lot here that we could go into. I'll see where the questions come up really to see how much of this people want to know. But you've got three examples we're going to just run through of the, of the issues that came up during testing. There, sure, thanks, Mark. So the first issue I've chosen here is to do with uh, form field. Hello, can you hear me, Mark? Yeah, yeah I can hear you, yes, yeah. Yeah, sorry. So the, the first issue I wanted to talk about is form field labeling. And, you know, with most apps, there's a good degree of interaction, and form fields are one way of users inputting data into the app. Now, on the screen, you should, should be able to see the left-hand screenshot is the form before a user fills in the information and the fields are labelled by virtue of the, the placeholder text in each field there. So a sighted user can see that, and as they, as they enter the information as shown on the right-hand side, those labels are overwritten with the sort code and account number as they've put them in there. Now, as a sighted user, you can see the your account details heading there, and that can prompt you when you're going back to change information which is the sort code field and which is the account number field. But a screen read user, when they're hearing those those fields read back, will just hear back text field uh, 2016 56 rather than text field telling them it's a sort code and then allowing them to change the value. So, so the key recommendation here was really to have a hidden accessibility label that gets announced to screen reader users before any value within the field. So it's a very simple recommendation to implement but it does have um, quite an effect on the, on the usability for users. And, and this was just in the registration part of the app, so obviously quite important. You need to use this before you go into the app. Thank you. And um, there's a question actually just about the disabled user testing. Could you just briefly mention the range of people who might be involved in the disabled user testing sorts of disabilities or impairments that they may be? Because you've mentioned voiceover quickly there yeah. for people with um, vision impairment. Okay, so, so our standard testing uh, involves either six or eight users, and we, we try to have people from a variety of backgrounds with a variety of disabilities. So, so we'll often have a couple of people with a visual impairment, and that might be somebody who is a screen reader user, someone else who has some uh, low level of vision but might use screen magnification or a high contrast color scheme. 
we'll have people who have a physical disability, so they might be um, find it difficult using a touch screen, uh, and they might use voiceover just because you can swipe through components, even, even as a sighted user, it can make things a bit easier. We'll have people who have cognitive difficulties as well, so somebody who might have dyslexia, someone else with learning difficulties, and they can, they can give feedback on perhaps comprehension issues, how easy content is to read. And there's, there's a few other um, disabilities represented when we're testing desktop apps, such as voice recognition users. But by and large, we'll have a sort of good cross-section on mobile apps. Um, just another um, range of users we'll often have as well is older users as well, who might have a variety of disabilities, including low vision. Uh, but it's useful to get that general feedback as well. Great, thank you. So, yeah, um, so, so there's another. Um, I'll, I'll just respond to a question from Sally about the visual label as well. So that, that's a good point. If you, if you just um, if you could just step back to the previous oh, sorry, slide. Uh, yeah. So so here we've got the as I said before, there's placeholder labels there, and they get overwritten as you type in. Now within the app itself, there are actual physical vis visual labels for all users that you can see all the time, and that that resolves this problem. Now, the, the long-term plan is to actually implement those visual labels as part of the registration process as well. But in this case, um, because that wasn't an issue that turned up in the user test, uh, the key issue that turned up in the user test was for screen reader users. Um, the decision was made just to provide an accessibility hint. But there is a long-term plan to provide visual labels elsewhere as well, including registration. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Sally. And um, please do, anyone else who's got questions, please do put them into the box and we'll answer those again. So this is another uh, labeling issue. And this, this again affected voiceover users. And it relates to the passcode entry screen. So this occurs when you've logged out of the app and you just want to quickly log back in. Users are given a five-digit passcode, which they need to, to enter each time, just as a security measure. Now, to... to uh, input the, the data, it's actually five separate input fields. And a key problem before was that for voiceover users, they weren't given any feedback over uh, which which field they were in, whether they'd entered um, number two, number three, number four, and so on. So now when you enter the, the passcode to the screen, you hear back announced to you digit three or five, digit four or five, as you're entering each uh, character. So that, that just gives you the feedback you need to know when you've entered the whole um, the whole string of your security code, and it will log you into the app. <coughs> and the final issue that we looked at was, was that relating to menu behavior. So this is the interactive component. Once you're into the app, you press the uh, hamburger icon at the top left of the screen, and that expands the menu or contracts the menu. And it's important, again, for, for voiceover users, that behaves in a intuitive and expected way. Um, so, so what happens is that the actual menu button describes itself as a menu open button when the menu is collapsed. So you know that interacting with it will open the menu. And that description then changes to close menu once you've opened the menu. There's also a degree of managing the focus. And that's the order in which the user reads the screen. So once the menu is opened, the, the voice over user will actually hear the menu read out rather than what's going on in the screen in the background. And as they go through the menu, once they get to the end, the focus gets taken to the close button. So they, they again get that feedback to tell them that, that uh, they are at the end of the menu. Closing it will just return them to the page. So it's, it's a fairly simple procedure, but it's, it's very important so that voiceover users get the same level of interaction and feedback as sighted users do. Great, thank you. I've got a question I see there from um, Gianni. I don't know if you see that, uh, Joe, about security concerns of reading out the digits on the previous screen. I'll just bounce back to that one. Well, um, and, uh, and that's my possibly a question for you as well, Paul. We, we did mention at the beginning some of the issues that, that, that the bank would have around accessibility. Um, but clearly, there are going to be security concerns and I wonder how much the accessibility and the security concerns, you know, at, at some point there had to be a compromise on one or the other, or were they able, were you able to resolve these sorts of things? And this is a very good example, isn't it, that you would actually have to have the numbers read out 
um, which could potentially present a security concern. Um, I guess first, Jeff, yes. did, you, did you see? Um, well, so, so just a bit of background as well. There is actually there were some additional security concerns with this um, this screen um, because obviously it's important that people can enter their their security code in a secure way. So it's necessary to provide this this custom keypad here, and uh, it, it's also set up so that you you can't use a Bluetooth keyboard at this stage as well because that sort of thing can expose your your password when you're typing it out. Um, I believe there is a setting within iOS itself for preventing password fields being announced or, or only when you're using headphones, for instance. So there is some level of mitigation built into the operating system to that extent. Um, Paul, um, we're just going to bounce onto the lessons learned, I think. But the thing about security from the bank's point of view, um, is there anything in particular that this project has raised around security questions or things that, that you know were important from the security side? Yeah, it, it's clearly this compromise between uh, security and accessibility. I think Joe's covered that the, um, you know, the numeric keypad is, um, is kind of custom components rather than using something out of the box, which would have been easier um, to you know, manage and satisfy our security concerns. Um, I think for us, really, it's giving this personalization and choice. So when we think about banking in general and security questions we're all familiar with, you know, of what's your inside leg measurement or the street you first grew up on, whatever else, it, it's kind of having a, a range of alternatives people can use to ID themselves. Clearly for this app, once you set it up, you, you get a, a text to your mobile phone and you pass that security um, code in, but you still have to remember and enter a five-digit PIN, which clearly some of our customers um, may struggle with, right? If um, with cognitive impairments, if we're older, if you have dyslexia, for example. So we're continuously looking at what plan B is um, for those folks, whether it's how you get into your mobile banking app or um, you know, chip and pin, for example, um, how you authenticate within our branches. Okay, thank you. And then moving on to the broader lessons, um, Clara, you've mentioned a few of these, I think, in terms of you know, include it at the beginning. I'm quite interested in yeah. the team stuff, you know, the, the fact that the team wasn't familiar with working in this way. Um, and this guidelines about, you know, not having separate guidelines, trying to, to build them in. And you've got some examples here, the personas and so on. Can you tell us a bit about how that has changed in your team? No, absolutely. I think, you know, a few changes that we've made through the redesign project, which is now kind of benefiting all our projects, is, is that you know, looking at how can be embedded in what we do, because you know, as that everyone will agree with accessibility and things is a great uh, benefit for the bank. Um, you know, everyone will want to work in and make something that is an inclusive design. And um, but you know, how do we make sure that all the people that are involved in projects are always made aware or kept in the loop of what's happening around accessibility? So from a proposition perspective. What we notice is that you know some projects will have personas with impairments, others not. Now we've just created um, some general personas for everyone to use, and the, and we've made sure that some of these personas have impairments, whether that's uh, you know a visual impairment, a mobility impairment. But just making sure from the start of shaping a proposition that it's been thought about. Then as the next step, we then looked at okay, it's a design. What do we do around design? And we have UI guidelines um, that obviously look at color contrast, etc. But uh, we then decided, well, why don't we just add some accessibility hints in there? We know, for example, that certain buttons will always give us um, problems you know, on how they are coded because not every developer knows. But it's also important sometimes for the designer to be aware that certain issues may come across. It's just creating awareness across all of the, all of the teams, really. And then as a third bit was looking, you know, how do we support developers? And again, we've got a big pool of developers in different countries. We're not all based together. Um, so there's a lot of different skill sets, knowledge levels, expertise. And what we, what we started doing is, um, together actually with, with Joe, is create design patterns. And these design patterns are accessibility friendly. So, you know, we're trying to give our developers the right kind of tools that they can just pull that are compliant, I guess, or accessibility um, supportive. So just to make their job a little bit easier to support in what we do. As you said, I do believe it's great to have um, you know, a separate uh, site for accessibility with much more detail, but we have to make sure we bring accessibility to everyone and make it really easy. And just around the point um, 
you know, um, what I mentioned earlier around, you know, when we did accessibility reviews in the past and they were a little bit later on in the journey, I can tell you with my experience now, no one will argue um, why you shouldn't do inclusive design. So if you work on a project and you want to bring in someone a little bit early to say, you know, let's, uh, let's make this an inclusive design so it works for all, it's very, I mean, I cannot imagine that someone will object to that because you would want it to work for everyone. Thank you. And, you know, just, yeah, sorry. Sorry, and, and Paul, the, the, the obviously sort of stepping back from the individual project and, and Clara's sort of hands-on stuff is more broadly that, you know, the, the, the value to, to, the, to the business is, is clear to you as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're certainly seeing anecdotally um, some great customer feedback coming in uh, a month or two after releasing the app uh, about taking a similar approach um, in terms of accreditation for other um, apps that we have, ping it and so forth, other platforms, uh, web presence, and it's really changing in my mind this traditional relationship with access consultants of coming in and testing at the end af afterwards and giving a big long list of issues, um, whereas actually now it's bringing in to get involved throughout. So there is that knowledge sort of share and transfer, um, you know, with our designers to actually understand how you'd go about implementing Plan B. Um, and, you know, to Clara's point, it's, it's almost breaking up into role-based, so rather than very stuffy and stale standards, having here's what you need to know for specific roles, whether that's, you know, the designers and UI guys and personas, or what our testing teams need to do, so they're a bit more focused in terms of, um, you know, exploratory testing and test scripts and so forth. Great, thank you. So, um, if, uh, thank you, thank you, everyone, and that's on to some questions now. Um, if anybody has a question, as I say, there's a question down the side. Oh, we've got a question here. Yes, thanks, Sally. Um, uh, what accredited? What standards are we accredited to? Because obviously, um, there's a question here. This might be one for you, Robin or, or or Joe. I think. You know, what are the standards that we've used? Um, and because there isn't an industry standard for native apps currently, can you just explain a little bit about how we, you know, what we use for our accreditation and how that related to the app, to the app? So I'm. Um, I don't know which one of the two of you knows the most about that. I'm is, that you? To... is that you, Robin? So basically, um, AbilityNet has always been a coalface organisation. We, we, you know, assess disabled people. We uh, work with disabled people um, as our user testers on the accessibility consultancy side. So um, our accreditation is very much based around technical compliance plus real life user testing. So as Mark said. Mm -hmm. Unlike with web, there isn't a de facto, you know, WCAG 2.0 AA level of compliance. So it's just a question of making sure that the developers have adhered to the accessibility guidelines within the iOS software development kit or, or Android's SDK, and then making sure that it works with actual end user technologies, preferably wielded by those end users themselves. Um, so testing with with voiceover, testing with talkback, testing with Zoom, uh, changing the color contrast, um, changing the different accessibility settings within those different mobile devices, and making sure that the uh, app still performs well and there aren't any issues. So it's just it's it's much more around a practical, real life accreditation. Okay, and anything to add, Joe, in terms of your sort of direct experience, you mentioned the ways that you test things. They sound similar to how you would test a desktop, um, but obviously some changes in terms Yeah, of there's a lot of similarities. The only thing I'd add is we found that the disabled user testing really valuable because when I carry out um, my own testing of an app, you know, I raise issues with a certain priority, high, medium, or low, and so on. And that can help guide developers in terms of, you know, which issues they address first. But I'm not a native user of VoiceOver, so by getting disabled users involved and getting their feedback on issues, it really helped to corroborate what I found. Or in some cases, you know, I found an issue and I thought, well, that might be quite high impact. But actually, we got you know eight disabled users in, and and you know a couple of them encountered it and said, actually, that's not a big issue. So we can you know um, downgrade the priority appropriately. So it's just a really good way of, of complementing the the more hands-on testing that we did. Okay, thank you. Then. Question here about whether was it was the decision to use native um, app? Did that reflect any accessibility issues? Are they by nature more or less as accessible as a web-based or a hybrid app? 
I don't know, Joe, again, Joe, I, I think probably, or Robin, is, is there something intrinsically more accessible about doing it in an essay? Well, I, I suspect that from Barclay's point of view, um, the accessibility or otherwise of, you know, a native app versus web probably didn't feature large in their, dis in their decision making, but I can certainly tell you from an accessibility point of view, the native app is, is very uh, preferable, particularly in iOS, where you almost get accessibility free if you just um, use standard controls and the documentation is very clear about layering on accessibility for custom controls. Um, and it's a, just a much more cut down, clean experience. Um, you can start having a hybrid approach where you've got HTML embedded within a web, uh, in a, a mobile, and then you've got obviously mobile versions of, of your main website as well. But the sort of, the most obvious and probably the, the first go-to place for disabled people is the, is the native app. Right. Because the experience with that is is um, typically that much more uh, accessible because it's relatively easier, relatively speaking, easier to make them accessible than a website. Cool. And and there's a question here. I'm going to ask Clara this one because I, I think I know what you're going to say, Robin. But um, Clara, were there any particular differences that you experienced across the different platforms, and particularly in terms of accessibility? You know, the iOS, Android, Windows, and BlackBerry that you mentioned. Was, was anything jump out at you there about that, how it, one or other was good or bad or easy or difficult to work with? No, absolutely. And, to, and just to clarify, we actually got accredited for iOS. Um, iOS is much um, more supportive of accessibility. You know, the, the features that they have, you know, the guidance that they give, it is easier to work with. Um, the, I, I'm, my understanding is also that um, um, customers with impairment more likely are using iOS just because of its support that it gives. Um, you know, the voiceover is very clear. If you start looking at Android, um, we try to be as supportive of accessibility as we can, but due to the platform differences within Android and its, on its own, it's very difficult actually to um, have an Android app across all the different operating systems that actually work very well. There's different screen readers, etc. so it's not as easy with Android. Um, but you can obviously there's still things you can do. Um, you know, I think actually with Barclays we do tend to um, focus on uh, Google Nexus as well as one of the ones uh, one of the devices that that we try to be as accessible with as possible. But yeah, it's, as I said, there is there are differences for sure. Great, thank you. And somebody's uh, thank you helpfully, Michael uh, published and uh, noticed that noted that the recently published EN301549 standard does give some requirements for software based on WCAG 2.0 and that may be required in public procurement contracts in the future so you know that the platform stuff is is going to have to be addressed in some way because if it's more more usable on some platforms than others it may well be that there will be constraints on um, public sector contracts certainly in, in terms of the use of apps in, in certain settings and Robin do we do we know from our side what the policy things are likely to be in the, in the next stage, because obviously mobile is becoming more important. And here's a good example of a, an app that's been accredited but only managed it on one platform. Um, what, what do you think are the next stages of that process in terms of standards and uh, accreditation? Yeah, I think it, it's going to be difficult because with HTML and um, other web technologies, they're broadly applied. I mean, you know, it, the internet is the internet, but when it comes to different operating systems, um, you're right, EN301 is, is on the horizon and it's agnostic, so one would argue that it could apply to those different platforms. The problem is that you can't be technology specific because the technology isn't, isn't the same across those platforms. So it's more on the principle level. So um, it's, it is more challenging and, and as um, Clara was saying, um, iOS is very much favoured, but that would be the first port of call that you should consider um, in your sort of priority list. And then if you have to pick a, a handset for Android, then certainly the Nexus range because they're very much more affordable. So Nexus 5 is probably used by, um, you know, it's the, it's the majority handset used by blind users who can't basically afford iOS or don't want to get locked into the Apple ecosystem. Um, so you have to be that much more selective. And I can't see there being a harmonised unified approach to um, being able to, to sort of technically specify accessibility across mobile platforms in the foreseeable future. Okay, thank you. 
Great. Well, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, that's the uh, end of the questions I've seen coming in and the, and the end of the session as far as we're concerned. A huge thank you to Clara and Paul from Barclays. Thank you very much for, for sharing your um, experience. I think that uh, you know, an over, overall picture for all of us is that you know, your projects have to change shape to, to encompass accessibility. But it's also been interesting to see from the app point of view, you know, where that fits into the business and the, and the future direction and how that's going to influence the developments in the future. So thank you very much for sharing that. And um, thank you to Joe and to, to Robin for joining us. And um, uh, the next uh, webinars that we're running from AbilityNet, there's one on the 14th of April about controlling your computer with your voice. And then another on the 23rd of April about UX and accessibility and, and the similarities and differences between them. Uh, if you do want to know any more about what we do, have a look on our website um, or give us a call. I'll speak to sales at abilitynet.org.uk. Um, we'll tell you more about the, the testing services and, and things you've heard about today. Um, so thank you all very much uh, for coming in and uh, uh, joining in, Clara, Paul, Joe and uh, Robin. And uh, we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.